Welcome from the Martin B. Greenberg Trading Room on the beautiful uh, Hofstra campus, and also from the home of the award-winning benchmark beating uh, student managed investment fund at Hofstra University. Uh, today we are here uh, to discuss an episode in financial markets that has been in the media a lot since uh, the new year, uh, dealing with Robin Hood and GameStop. Uh, my name is Edward Zikowitz. I'm a professor in the finance department in the Zarb School at Hofstra. Uh, I'm also the chairperson. Uh, today we have two uh, Wall Street veterans who will be joining us in the discussion. Uh, momentarily, I'll introduce them more formally. Uh, but what I'd like to do first uh, is take a look at a few slides to provide a setting for today's uh, discussion. Uh, those two Wall Street veterans are uh, Professors Ron Frank and uh, also Professor Jornaby. Um, and right now I'll switch my screen, uh, share my screen with you uh, to get us going. Okay, this is uh, our beautiful home of the Frank G. Zarb School of Business uh, on the Hofstra campus. Uh, a beautiful building with a lot of uh, technology, cybersecurity lab, and this trading room that we're in. Uh, as I said, today we will be discussing uh, Robin Hood and GameStop, making history or repeating it. Okay, uh, again, my name is Dr. Ed Zikowitz. I'm the chair of the finance department at uh, Hofstra University. Uh, we also have uh, Paul Jornaby joining us. Uh, he is uh, an adjunct professor of finance at the Zarb uh, School. He teaches money and capital markets. Uh, prior to joining us, uh, Paul spent 10 years on Wall Street working in the equity and debt capital markets. Uh, he spent the majority of his career advising companies, financial sponsors, and governments on raising capital in the public and private markets. He began his career at Lehman Brothers and also worked at Barclays UBS uh, before retiring from the Bank of America last year. Paul is also an alum of Hofstra, graduating with a BBA in finance. Uh, he also earned an MBA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So Paul will be one of our Wall Street veterans discussing this timely uh, topic. Uh, we also have with us Professor Ron Frank. Uh, Ron is a chartered financial analyst and an adjunct professor in the finance department and has been teaching at Hofstra for 10 years. Uh, he sits on the supervisory board of the Hofstra Student Managed Investment Fund and has also consulted in the private equity and insurance sectors. Prior to Hofstra, Ron was an equity research analyst on Wall Street for more than 20 years most of their time with Citigroup and predecessor firms. So those will be um, our discussants on this topic today. Uh, but as I mentioned, what I'd like to do is take a look at uh, the setting of our discussion today because uh, it involves a number of players and a num number of ideas that have kind of converged uh, to produce a media type of uh, uh, interest uh, over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, we have hedge funds involved. We have social media involved that we'll discuss, and of course, uh, the role of Robin Hood. Uh, but what I'd like to uh, bring your attention to now is the price behavior uh, since the start of the new year of uh, GameStop stock. Uh, and certainly what we've heard about was the extreme volatility. Uh, and on this particular chart, 
Uh, I have days such as January 26, uh, when uh, the GameStop stock was up by 90%, the next day up 135% then down 41%. These are daily percentage changes and are highly unusual. Uh, within this story and in our discussion, the terms will come up, but there may be some people in our audience who are not familiar, many are, I'm sure, uh, about the idea of a short sale and a short squeeze. Uh, so that everyone kind of enjoys the discussion. Uh, I'll briefly uh, say a few things about what a short sale is and what we mean about a short squeeze. Okay. All right. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what is a short sale? Uh, a short sale, we can begin by thinking it's opposite to a common type of transaction. In a common transaction uh, that are, uh, we see more often is we want to buy now uh, at a low price and wait for a stock to go up and sell it at a high price. So we do the buying first and hopefully at a profit, the selling second. Uh, with a short sale, it's in reverse. What happens is the selling comes first and the buying of the stock comes second. Uh, in a short sale, uh, the seller of the stock does not actually own the stock, but they borrow it. So instead of borrowing money, they're buying shares that they will have to repay at some point uh, in return, some point in the future. Uh, and the motivation of the person doing one of these short sells uh, when they borrow the shares is for the price to go down. Uh, so that's the motivation behind it. Um, and as an example, uh, if we, a short seller shorts or sells first, borrows the shares, sells them, uh, for $100, they're hoping that the price goes down. So if it goes down to $50 after they borrowed the shares, sold them for 100 and it goes down to 50, they're happy. They're happy because they can then buy the shares at $50, return them. So they sold first at 100, bought back at 50, so they made a profit on that transaction. Uh, and with the case of GameStop, uh, there were people who were shorting it a lot. Uh, and the subject company of our discussion today uh, is GameStop. GameStop, uh, I don't believe, made a profit for a couple of years. Uh, they're a brick or, and mortar type of business. Uh, those are having a hard time and then the pandemic hit and a shopping mall traffic went down and hurt uh, the GameStop even more. Uh, so the outlook did not look promising. So there were participants in the market who believed that GameStop's uh, future does not look uh, good and they decided to short it because they expected the price to go down. Uh, on the other hand, uh, kind of the other side of this little example is if we short or a short seller sells the borrowed stock for 100 and it begins to rise, it begins to go up to $150. So they made, they sold something that they borrowed for $100. Now they have to return it and it's worth 150. They have to buy it back at a higher price. Uh, they're losing. Uh, and in a circumstance like that, uh, they may either close the position to minimize their losses or the broker where they're making this transaction may ask for additional money as collateral to support uh, this kind of position. And this latter case leads us to uh, a short squeeze. Uh, we've heard that uh, in conjunction with this 
uh, episode with Robin Hood and GameStop, but uh, what exactly is a short squeeze? Well, when there, uh, it's a kind of the increase in the price of a stock, as we've seen, one day up 90%, another day 135% for game stock. It's a rapid increase in the price on a stock that's being shorted a lot. There are a lot of short sellers. There were at those days when it went up a lot on GameStop. And then the price began to rise. The price began to rise of GameStop and those short sellers who then were losing. Okay, they were not making a profit and either they had to add more collateral or margin, as it's called, uh, had to do so, or they were closing the positions and needing to buy GameStop back. As they did so, that increased the demand for GameStop and raised uh, the uh, price of it. So a short squeeze is a rapid increase in the price of the stock where there are a lot of short positions. Uh, and then when these positions uh, are being closed, it further pushes up that price. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the fundamentals. Uh, at that time, it's just all this short covering of positions. So that was a central element of uh, okay. Okay. Uh, central element of uh, the episode involving GameStop is, well, uh, over this uh, initial period. So now uh, what we'll do is we'll delve deeper, okay, into the players involved, uh, the activities taking place. And uh, first we'll have a uh, Professor Frank uh, talking about Robin Hood and its role in this entire episode. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, we thought it would be helpful before getting into the actual events of the past couple of weeks to step back and just take a look at what exactly Robin Hood is, how did it get here, its business model, and so on. What I'm going to try to do is provide a very brief overview of the company up to the point of the GameStop episode, and that's where Paul will take over. Robin Hood's story dates back about eight years, when a couple of Stanford graduates who had previously divine, designed trading software for hedge funds decided to create an app that would simplify the stock trading experience for small and first-time investors. The company's stated mission is to democratize finance for all. The Robinhood app is relatively fun and easy to use. It's been actually described as having a game-like feel uh, by many who have used it. Um, starting an account takes virtually no time to do, and the website has various educational tools, including, interestingly enough, in light of recent events, a whole section on volatility. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Importantly, there are no commissions. We um, now take no commission trading for granted, but this is only a recent development in financial markets and Robinhood and others like it deservedly get a fair amount of credit for leading the charge among online brokers to eliminate commissions. That said, now that no commission trading is fairly standard in the industry, uh, Robinhood's principal competitive edge appears to remain that, that unique customer experience uh, of, associated around its website, its uh, app rather, which emphasizes, again, simplicity, simplicity and enjoyability. Uh, the app experience actually is often compared to Instagram, although I can't confirm that because I've never used Instagram. Um, enter the pandemic, and we've all seen the stories about bored individuals stuck at home with nothing to do, taking up day trading, uh, leading to dramatic increases in volume for online brokers such as Robinhood. Now, one obvious question you may ask, and one that's gotten more attention uh, just over the past year or so, and has again in the wake of the whole GameStop episode, is if Robinhood doesn't charge commissions, how does it make money? Well, the answer is a few main ways that are described on the company's website. First, Robinhood gets what is commonly called payment for order flow. I'm guessing that's a phrase you've seen and heard more of over the last uh, few weeks. And we're gonna get back to that one in just a moment. Second, Robinhood offers a gold account, 
where customers pay $5 a month and get expanded research and market data uh, preferential margin rates. Third, they make money by, um, <clears throat> excuse me, lending stocks that have been, bar that have been bought on margin uh, to uh, counterparties, which would typically be short sellers. And finally, they earn interest from idle cash balances on customer accounts, as well as cash products associated with those accounts like debit card. Now, it's very important to note here that none of the revenue streams I've just described are at all unique to Robinhood. As a matter of fact, they're fairly common in the securities industry. All right, back to payment for order flow. As many of you know, market makers in various securities, including options and stocks, make money from the bid-ask spread on trades. That is the difference between the price they pay for a security and the price they sell the security for at any given time. So the money they earn is a significant function of spreads and trading volume. These market makers will frequently pay some portion of this spread to firms like Robinhood in exchange for the order flow or trading volume that they're providing to the market makers. Payment for order flow is a permitted practice. And as I mentioned, it's not at all unique to Robinhood. As a matter of fact, it's actually been credited by many with enabling commission-free trading and therefore being good for investors. And that was a sentiment that was recently expressed uh, by a member of the Senate Banking Committee. Where payment for order flow can become controversial is when it's seen as running counter to the principle of best execution, meaning that customers are getting the best available prices when they transact in securities. The regulators want to make sure that brokers aren't sacrificing best execution by favoring market makers that provide these payments. Now, remember, when we're talking about best execution, we're not talking about anything as blatant as charging a customer $15 for Ford when it's, when it's quoted at $11.50. The difference between the best available price and an inferior price is more often a matter of pennies or less, a difference that the average retail investor might not even notice, but that can sometimes add up to meaningful numbers. Anyway, this all did become an issue for Robinhood just last December, when the SEC charged the firm with having failed to adequately disclose its practice of payment for order, receiving payments for order flow, and having failed to satisfy its duty to seek best execution for its customers. Robinhood settled the matter by agreeing to, among other things, paying a $65 million penalty without admitting or denying any wrongdoing and retaining an independent consultant to review its policies and procedures. Keep in mind that this all predated the GameStop episode. Charges from the SEC related to years 2019 and prior. And as a matter of fact, Robinhood currently provides various execution statistics on its website that appear to paint a pretty favorable picture of its more recent performance on best execution. Now, payment for order flow has again come under the microscope in the context of the GameStop episode, but interestingly enough, the focus has not been so much on best execution as it has been on the particular parties involved, and that's where I'll hand over to Paul. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Ed, for setting the stage on short selling, and thanks, Ron, for setting the stage on Robinhood, which... I think is an important part of this story. And I think having an understanding of Robin Hood's business model and how they make money is important. And the analogy that I like to use when talking about Robin Hood is it's in many ways similar to Facebook or Instagram, where you don't pay anything up front in order to use the service, but those companies use your data and your information and earn a profit from that. So the business model in, in my view is largely one of us as users being the, the product, uh, the product for the company, if that makes sense. So as Ed said, the GameStop situation has been really, really high profile in 2021. But to tell the full GameStop story, I'm going to go back a little earlier to the summer of 2019. And in the summer of 2019, when GameStop stock was at about $5.63, a gentleman by the name of Keith Gill started talking about the company and his investment in the company in a subreddit called Wall Street Bets, 
and on a YouTube channel that he started called Roaring Kitty. And he basically made the case that the company was fundamentally undervalued and that this, the price of the stock of the company could and should rise in the future. And what he actually did was he bought January 2021 calls on the stock. Again, when the stock was about $5 a share, he bought January 21 calls on those shares at $20. And so that's where, at least as far as my research is concerned, where GameStop first started getting some momentum in the online communities. Next, at the end of August of 2019, so that same year, an investor named Michael Burry disclosed that he had taken a 3% stake in GameStop, long stake, long shares in GameStop. Now, for those of you that read the book, The Big Short, or that watched the movie, The Big Short, Michael Burry was one of the people who um, called the collapse in the real estate market early and made a small fortune in the subprime loan market on the short side of that market. So interestingly, here he's long in the big short, he was obviously short. And he published a letter. And in that letter, he basically said to the company, you're trading, you, the market cap of your company is actually less than the amount of cash you have on your balance sheet. You have a tremendous amount of short interest in your stock. And I recommend that you use your cash to buy back some of your shares and move the stock price higher and increase your earnings per share. So Michael had an investment in the company that was partly fundamentally driven, but also partly technically driven where he was, he didn't use these words, but he was effectively saying the company could create a short squeeze by buying shares by, it, by buying its own shares back and forcing the share price higher. So he made that investment in August, uh, late August of 2019. And at that point, GameStop was trading at $3.97 a share. Fast forward to April of 2020. Again, as Ron mentioned, the pandemic hits, people are at home. Uh, the number of retail investment accounts that are being opened is skyrocketing. Trading volume in the equity market is increasing dramatically from retail investors. And the amount of chatter in um, Reddit spaces like Wall Street Bets and on YouTube channels and in social media from this point begins to really, really ramp up. And in fact, just a quick, just a quick fun fact um, according to Goldman Sachs, they say from April of 2020 to today, so about 11 months, that the number of trades from retail investors has increased roughly 300%. And the dollar value of those trades is up almost 85%. So again, just giving you some data to, to, to help illustrate the rise in retail trading and retail interest in the stock market. So next, I'll take you to August 31st of 2020, when a gentleman by the name of Ryan Cohen, who was the founder of Chewy, which was eventually sold to PetSmart for $3 billion, so founder of a very successful e-commerce business, discloses that he's taken a 10% position in GameStop and that he believes fundamentally they can transform their business and create tremendous shareholder value um, really by transitioning from a brick and mortar seller of consoles to a more e-commerce focused gaming company. So at the end of August, 2020, the, the share price of, of GameStop is $7.09. Now, in mid-September of 2020, there's a lot of chatter in Wall Street bets and a lot of talk of a potential short squeeze. So at this point, you see a lot of posts about the fact that 
the number of short, uh, the short interest in GameStop is 120% of the free float of the company. So for every share that's free floated, which is about 50 million shares, there's 1.2 shares that have been shorted in the market. They also talk about the new console cycle, which is upcoming. The fact that console, those new consoles will not be all digital immediately. And they talk about the fact that GameStop has a really, really strong loyalty program with over 55 million active users. And they highlight this as a short squeeze opportunity. At the end of September, share price of GameStop is up to $10.20. Now, fast forward to the middle of November 2020. The same Ryan Cohen, who's accumulated a 10% stake, sends a letter uh, and publishes this letter to the board of directors of the company. And he's calling for a strategic review of the company's alternatives. And he is basically saying, I think this company can transform itself and create tremendous value. And he's effectively asking for him and some of his colleagues to go on the board of directors to help facilitate this transition. He does this in late November. And at this point, the share price of GameStop is up to $16.56. So in this entire time from 19 through 2020, where GameStop is not front and center in the media, the share price has gone from about $4 when Michael Burry invested to about $16 at the end of November. So now, I'll move us into 2021. On January 11th, GameStop agrees to have Ryan Cohen and two of his colleagues from Chewy join the board of directors. And at the end of that day on January 11th, the stock closes at $19.94. Three days later, as the chatter really starts to accelerate on social media and people are calling Ryan Cohen the savior of GameStop, on the 14th of January, so three days later, the shares have doubled from 1994 to $39.91 a share. And that's the point at which the short squeeze really begins and the social media chatter gets so great that the shares go from 39.91 a week later they're on the 22nd of January they're at $65 and then a few days later on January 27th they peak at $347.51 so think about that for a second Michael Burry and Keith Gill talk about this stock at at around 4 to 5 dollars a share and on January 27th, it hits $3.47, sorry, $347.51. Now, what's been talked about in the media is this tremendous movement by individual investors on Robinhood, in Wall Street bets, on TikTok, um, driving the share price higher and calling it a movement and turning it from an investment, from simply an investment, into a true movement and a true us against the hedge funds, the little guy against the big guy, Wall Street against Main Street. But what's interesting to note here is that alongside all this retail frenzy to buy, there were also hedge funds in this January period who were help driving the price up while other hedge funds were scrambling to cover their short. So this rally was, I would say, precipitated by retail investors, but certainly aided by hedge funds who were not short the stock, but who saw a tremendous opportunity to profit from the significant momentum. So then we get to the fateful day, January 28th, where Robinhood and some other brokers or trading platforms, I should say, announce that given margin requirements, 
and capital constraints that they are going to restrict trading in GameStop. Um, and I think there's been some misinformation around this point. And, and in my opinion, I don't think that Robin Hood did a fantastic job communicating on that Thursday and on, on that Friday about what was exactly happening. But from everything that we know today, and I think there's still more information that'll come to light over the next couple of weeks, certainly as this makes its way um, into the, you know, into the SEC and into Congress for some testimony. Robin Hood, because of the way the settlement and clearing system works, was forced or had to post collateral for the amount of trading that was happening on their platform that they did not have at that time. So it doesn't appear that this was a conspiracy by hedge funds or um, a single hedge fund to stick it to the little guy, for lack of a better term. It was much more a function of the risk management systems within Robinhood and the capital requirements that are a part of this clearing system that, gain, uh, that Robinhood had to limit trading in order to remain solvent. And one of the things that you saw is that over the course of the day on Thursday, that January 28th day, Robinhood raised a billion dollars from investors. And then over that weekend raised an incremental $2.4 billion to help meet that increased posting or collateral requirement that they had because of their trading volume. Um, if you followed the stock since then, it's interesting to note that from a high of $347.51 on January 27th, the stock uh, has come down meaningfully. And as of the close of business today is sitting at $48.47. The volume of trading in, in GameStop has come down dramatically. Um, the high volume day was about 200 million shares of stock traded in a day. And that's down to about 20.6 million shares of stock traded today. So I think with that, maybe I'll pause. And now that we've talked about short selling, we've talked about Robin Hood, and we've given a little bit of an overview of the events that led up to January 28th. I think it probably makes sense to pause for a minute and take some questions from the audience. So, Ed, I'll turn it back to you um, and you can maybe throw some questions to Ron and I. Okay. Uh, thank you, Paul. And thank you, Ron. Uh, I think Paul touched uh, upon this a little, but there are a number of uh, questions coming in that are asking uh, for thoughts on whether the restrictions that Robin Hood placed on trading were right uh, or even ethical, some questions are raising. The concern is investors um, were expecting to be able uh, to trade and then these restrictions uh, happen. Uh, so there's a number of questions along that line. Um, any thoughts uh, on that? Well, I'll, I'll start off. Um, you know, we, we I didn't I, I was the one who suggested the making history or repeating it title. And I did so for a reason. And, and that is, you know, I think part of the misperception that Ed and Paul have mentioned around this whole episode is the notion that everything we saw happen has never happened before and is a and is a total black swan in the history of financial markets. You know, Paul just described to you the issue of the margin requirements and how the, the call for collateral uh, uh, put Robinhood in a bind. You know, when that happens, and this is not at all the first time a company has gotten, or a financial firm has gotten a little ahead of its skis with respect to um, margin requirements or and relative to its capital or available uh, resources, um, you really have only two choices, raise the bridge or lower the river. And if you can't do one, you've got to do the other. Um, so if that indeed, as it appears, was the proximate cause of, of, um, of the action they took regarding trading, uh, trading in the stock, then 
it's not so much a question of ought they have done it, but the, the questions that will then be asked will be, um, given that they needed to do it, did they do it in the best way they could in a way that minimized disruption to markets or to their customers? And, you know, those are, I think, the kind of questions that will be asked as this, as this process um, goes forward. And, you know, Paul, I'll open it up for yeah, the only thing I would add to that, and I, I agree, based on the, the events as we know them now, it doesn't appear that Robinhood had the alternative of continuing to take buy orders in GameStop because the clearinghouse, which they rely on, just wasn't going to allow it. So the question then becomes, what could they have done to prevent this from happening? And what can they do in the future to prevent it from happening again? And I think, and not, not to make, not to oversimplify or make light of the situation, but had they anticipated the level of trading and level of volatility in GameStop and that small handful of other stocks, which we haven't really talked about here, but I'm sure people who have been following this have heard AMC, and BlackBerry and Bed Bath and Beyond and names like that. I think had had Robinhood anticipated that and raised incremental capital a couple of days earlier, it's possible and 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 likely that they could have been able to keep the gates open and allow full trading across their platform. Um, I think it's as someone who's watched the market closely for a couple of decades, and, and I would put Ron in the same category as watching the markets closely for a, a couple of decades. On Monday of that week, had you asked me when Robinhood was at $76 a share, if I thought it was gonna be you know, $347 a share on Wednesday, I would have told you quite frankly, there's no way that that happens. So, Firms like Robinhood and other and, and other trading platforms have pretty sophisticated software that analyzes value at risk and does tremendous amount of scenario analysis. And I think this event, if you want to talk about what it, you know, a black swan event, I think the movement in GameStop right now appears to be a black swan event. And so with the benefit of hindsight, what could have been different? I think GameStop could have got out in front of this and raised more capital sooner to prevent having to put these curbs in place. But from what we know now, they didn't have the option of keeping trading open in GameStop yeah. on that Thursday. Just one other thing very quickly, and, and, and I want to leave time for other questions, is that you know, when a large diversified firm has this happen, they have multiple funding sources they can tap, large in-place credit lines. Um, they can move, they have an ability within limits to move some liquidity among their, their various units. Um, the, the largest institutions can go to the, the overnight funding markets like the repo market and so on um, to raise funds they need on a temporary basis. Not so for a company the size of Robinhood and, and as much less diversified companies such as Robinhood. So you have to keep that in mind too, in terms of what their, their um, you know, options were for, for dealing with the situation. Okay, uh, great. Uh, there's a few more questions coming in. Uh, okay, right, I'll just read this one. Uh, do you think social media will become a greater influence on the stock market? And do you feel there will be greater regulations? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll take a first crack at that and then, uh, and then I'd love to hear Ron's thoughts. I think that social media absolutely will continue to be a bigger force and bigger component of the market than it ever has before. I think what, what we've seen over the last 11 or 12 months in terms of the number of posts and the number of people posting and the number of people, individual people trading the market is a trend that is likely not going to reverse itself. And 
you know, the anecdotal story I like to tell is I knew things were different when I came home from work and my 11 year old daughter told me that she asked me about GameStop because she saw it from her favorite TikTok follow. And I knew right then and there that we were in a different market and a different world. I also think that uh, institutional money managers, hedge funds and mutual funds are viewing this the same way. And I've spoken to a number of institutional money managers who are saying that they are more actively than ever watching social media, looking for mentions from various stocks to see if there's momentum. And they are in some cases hiring people uh, who are fluent in social media to help them understand what's happening in these chat rooms and on these platforms like Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, and that they are watching retail trading activity as a proxy for social media activity more closely than ever because a crowd could form again around another stock, either on the long side, as in as was the case in GameStop, or potentially on the short side. And they want to be able to see that early and not get caught in the position that some of these hedge funds were caught in, where they either didn't see it or didn't think it was a real threat and it got out of control and put them in a really difficult position. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I, I, you know, social media has, has revolutionized pretty much every aspect of our lives. Why should investing be any different? The the only thing I would would say, um, in addition, would be, you know, I think it's important to remember that at the end of the day, notwithstanding the attention that this has gotten, it affected a pretty small corner of the market. You know, you know, in two thousand nine, the real estate. Um, it started in the real estate market. It spread to other asset markets and around the world and became a systemic event. Here, it began and ended with a handful of relatively small stocks, um, uh, and that was and that was it. Um, you know whether this becomes a trend that can affect broader swaths of the market um, or even spill over into other markets. I think is something that might be a bigger lift, and and we may or may not see. But I think it's it's certainly um, reasonable to expect, as Paul's mentioned, and as he's talked to his institutional friends, that this could be rolling thunder and could be something that could be, you know, GameStop tomorrow and X Y Z the next uh, week and so on. Yeah, and the second part of that question focused on regulation in the future, and I think it's probably difficult for Ron and I to opine on, you know where we think regulation is going to go and uh, that's going to be handled in Congress in the, in the very near future. And, and I know the SEC is looking into various aspects of this. But what I will say is that generally speaking, regulators in financial markets, and ironically, we talked about this in my class last night, are, are primarily focused on two main topics. One topic is the timely, accurate, and detailed dissemination of information to the investing community. So the idea that everybody should have the same information and have it at the same time. And number two, they tend to be very focused on the health and stability of the financial system as a whole. So there are very various regulations around uh, capital requirements for banks and financial intermediaries to keep them solvent and various rules to make sure that the quote unquote system doesn't go down and there are no major issues with the financial system. So the fact that a large group of people got together, shared their opinions and beliefs and caused the big move in the star stock is really interesting, but I'm not sure that there's regulation that can be put in place that would prevent people from taking public information, sharing their opinion on it, and doing things that, that fundamentally don't impact the overall financial system. So I, those are my thoughts there. And, and Ron, I don't know if you 
had anything you want to add? Yeah, I would just say ditto. The, the, those are the two main areas of concern of the regulators. And as far as the, the system piece of it is, um, you know, you don't know, we don't know what they're going to do any better than anyone else, but the questions they will ask will be along the lines Paul said. They're going to ask, you know, um, what, well, was this a systemic event? And the answer seems to clearly have been, as I mentioned earlier, no. Um, and then the next question they'll ask is, could it happen again? And if it does, could it become a systemic event? And if the answer to one or both of those questions is yes, then is there something we need or can do about it from a policy standpoint? And you know, I think that'll be the thought process along the lines of the priorities that Paul mentioned. Where they end up on it will depend on you know, what they discover in the, in the course of looking into it and, and what they find themselves able to do if they feel they need to do something about it. Okay, uh, yeah, as uh, Paul mentioned, I think, uh, when he was uh, talking ab about this topic, uh, he mentioned that uh, retail investing picked up during the pandemic. People had time uh, to uh, invest. Uh, platforms like Robinhood perhaps made it trendy uh, even to uh, place transactions. Uh, so here's a good question, okay, that brings us a little down to earth. Uh, what would you suggest are the first steps in investing in the stock market and what advice do you have for the first time investors? Given this world and this episode, uh, Eddie? Sure. I'll, uh, I'll start on this and then I would absolutely love to get Ron's, Ron's thoughts on it as well. I think if you are out there and you are contemplating investing in the stock market, the first thing I would say is we'd love to have you. I think that the number of young people that are investing in the market is, is fantastic. I, I love the idea of the market being open and available to everybody. And I hate the idea that the stock market should be viewed as something for you know, Wall Street, the elite, the hedge funds, the baby boomers, whatever you want to call it. I, I love the idea of democratizing the stock market. That being said, if you're thinking about jumping into the stock market, I would advise you pretty strongly to do a couple of things. And th these are all before you download a trading app and, and start trading. First thing I would advise is to be really clear and really intentional on what your goals and objectives are when investing in the stock market. So what do I mean by that? If you have a certain amount of money that's sitting in a checking or savings account, and that is the money that you are planning to use to pay back your student loans, to ultimately buy a house, or if you're thinking really long-term to ultimately help you retire, I think how you invest uh, will be very different than if you are thinking about, you know, or your goal is to take a little bit of money and try to trade very actively and try to earn really high returns and take really high risk while you do that. So the first thing I would say is be very clear with yourself about what your goals and objectives are. Number two, I would say, ask yourself if I have, and I'm making this up, if I have $1,000 that I want to invest in the stock market and I invested it very aggressively and I ended up losing that $1,000, how would I feel? Would that be a life-changing event? Would that be a bummer, but not a big deal? Or would that be, uh, would you chalk that up to being a fun activity? So I think you want to think really deeply about what your objectives are in the market. And if you're investing in particularly, if you're, you're, you want to trade more in the short term and take higher risk, you want to be very clear about how you would feel if something went south. Um, the last thing I'll say, and I've had a number of conversations with people uh, on this topic, and uh, this is this is not fun. Number one and number two, I'm I'm far from an accountant or a tax professional, but 
what, if and when you decide to invest in the stock market and you make money, particularly if you make money in short-term trading, please don't forget that there's a tax bill associated with that uh, at the end of the year. So your trades are being reported um, to the IRS. And if you make a lot of money, just please be sure that you are setting aside money to pay that tax bill if and when it comes due. Um, so I'll stop there with my advice and then Ron would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I agree with all of that. It won't surprise you to know. And I would just add that, you know, when someone prescribes, when a doctor prescribes a medication for you, you're likely to ask the doctor a lot of questions about that medication. Are there side effects? Um, if you've had a problem with the medication before, will I have similar problems with this one? You might ask some friends if they've used it who have similar health issues. Uh, that were causing the prescription to be made for you and to begin with and so on. The same if a surgery is recommended, you get a second, a third, and a fourth opinion. Um, why not when you enter into investments for the first time? Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it doesn't so much apply to buying a stock just as a, a straight long position in a stock, but a number of these new investors, you read about episodes where they were involved in fairly complex and leveraged options positions, um, and in many cases, probably really did not know, you know, Paul said, you know, think about what you're willing to lose. Um, you have, you, that in many cases, these investors didn't even know what they could lose. Um, that, you know, understanding that when it's a leveraged position, you can learn, lose more than the equity you've got in the position uh, and so on. Um, that, that it's really, uh, it's really a, a, you really need to understand what it is you're doing. When I, when I um, trained new associates uh, when I was on Wall Street, one of the things I always said to them was when someone explains, tries to explain something to you three times and you still don't understand it, it's probably not because you're stupid. Okay. And what I meant by that was um, you, it should, it, it, there, if someone or who was vending this product to you should be able to explain to you in reasonably understandable terms, what it is, how it works, and 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 how it can affect you, and and if they can't, um, you might want to think twice about doing it. So you know, I, in addition to everything Paul said, which I agree with, I think you know, like with any other product that you consume, make sure you understand the product before you buy it. Okay, uh, great. Uh, all right, we have time for a couple more. Um, Here's one, uh, it says South Korea recently extended their ban on short selling. Do you think there should be more regulation on short selling and kind of to broaden that, uh, is short selling bad or is it bad for markets? Your thoughts? I'll start off, I, my, my general feeling is that short selling is not inherently bad. It's a, it's a part of the markets. Uh, you know, I'd almost answer by asking, is buying on margin bad? Um, you know, in the one case, you're, you're selling shares that you don't own. In another case, you're buying stock with money that you don't have. Um, is one better or worse than the other? I, I think you know, it's just a way that investors are able to express their views in, in, with investment strategies in the market. Um, they can profit or lose by those strategies. And, and that's what makes a market there. Are, you know, there are two sides to every trade. Um, I don't think uh, shorting is inherent, that there's anything inherently evil or, or bad about shorting, frankly, uh, in, a, in a broad sense. I agree with Ron. I think, you know, I, I think if anything, it helps make the market more two-sided and more efficient, not to get, you know, not, in, not to get into economic and market theory, but I think the ability to express uh, your view on a company on the short side helps make the market more efficient. Yeah. And I would add to that, that the hedge funds uh, often uh, are portrayed uh, in not the best light in the more popular press. Uh, but in the case of GameStop, there were fundamental reasons why they thought that uh, GameStop uh, was perhaps overvalued. And if nothing, the short sellers perhaps 
help markets to find kind of that price that coincides with intrinsic values. Without short selling, sentiment, uh, emotion, psychology can drive prices way above uh, intrinsic values. So uh, in that sense, um, yeah, I think it helps in the search for the right price um, in markets. And kind of uh, lastly, we're kind of coming towards the end. Um, hedge funds always are some villainized, okay, in the press and in other uh, places. Uh, and on Reddit, um, the, it was portrayed as retail investors and having some non-financial type of uh, views uh, about markets and hedge funds. Um, so could you just comment on uh, the idea of GameStop or GME and the episode as a movement? Sure. I, I think... Um... You know, personally, I think the idea of many people banding together behind a cause uh, or a purpose is is a great thing. I think that when you're trying to do that in the equity market against kind of nameless, faceless hedge funds, I think it can become a little bit dangerous. Because a lot of the posting that I saw around GameStop in the early to mid January timeframe was we're going to, you know, we're going to buy and we're going to own this forever. We're going to own this stock forever. And the problem with that, and it gets back to my point earlier about, you know, as you think about investing in the market, if you bought, in that euphoria at say a hundred dollars a share and you're out there saying this is a movement and I'm never selling and I'm never selling. And you probably feel pretty great when the stock hits $347 a share. But when all the other people in the movement start selling and leave the movement quietly and you're left holding stock that you bought for a hundred dollars a share, that's now worth $48 a share. Um, the movement probably doesn't feel quite as good as it did when the stock was at 350. So my point is expressing your belief in a movement by buying a stock to me is, is, is certainly not the safest. And, and in my opinion, not the greatest way to, you know, be a part of a movement. I just, I think it's dangerous. And for people who got caught up in it, and ended up buying high and are now looking at either owning the stock at a much lower price or who have sold the stock at a much lower price. I'm not sure that's the outcome that they were intending. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm just kind of uh, jumping in here because we do have a hard stop, I was told uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, so we're approaching that in less than a minute. So I don't have much else uh, I don't think we can field another question in those seconds, but uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Ron uh, and Paul, both for your very insightful uh, comments. Uh, and thank you for you everyone joining us and we hope uh, you join us again uh, in the future. So goodbye and good night. Thank you.